Um, so basically, I will try to be as serious as I can, but I'll try to disperse a couple of stories because, like what he was saying, the most important thing is you're a geochemist, but actually the, it's about looking at chemical reactions, whether that is in pure minerals or in a biological mineral fluid interface. It's just about chemical reactions. And all chemical reactions are actually just about making or breaking bonds. And so I will show you the work which we've been doing with my group in the last sort of like 10 years to a certain degree. But we're trying to understand whether you want to look at how a, a mountain becomes a sediment, how a tree changes the ground and makes soil, or what happens in the ocean in terms of its chemistry, it's all chemical bonds which are broken and made. But importantly, it's a scaling problem. So if you basically think about the fact that if you want to understand what happens when a river goes down to, a, to an ocean or how a soil forms, ultimately you have to understand how bonds are, make, are made and or broken. Because it's a matter of looking at a scale in terms of a temporal scale and a spatial scale, because all processes happen at this scale, but without this, you don't understand that. But without looking at the large scale, you can't know the small scale either. So by driving around yesterday with Louise, when there was actually very nice sunshine, we went up to Monteferra, I think, and we saw granites, right? So if you think about, this is a granite picture, if you think about how a granite actually is broken down, that means you had in your ocean, you have lots of these little granitic islands, they are broken down with the assumption is that it's all about mineral fluid reactions. But how do you go from something like that, eventually to form a soil, which looking around uh, Vigo, it's actually a very fertile soil. You make a lot of, you have a lot of green trees and plants, which actually are very happy. But you have to figure out how to go from there to there. And by doing that, you have to look at that scale. So the two examples which I'll show you is I'll break bonds first in minerals. And the most important example which I'm showing you is how fungi eat rocks. Now I asked him what fungi are called, and he said ego, or what are fungi in Spanish? Hogos, hogos, I didn't know. So how they eat rocks? Because actually what happens, you actually, the weathering engine of the world is um, just controlling many of the global element cycles. And that's where we go from a granite to a soil. But secondly, let's assume then we know how to break the bonds. In big parts of the geochemical cycle, you actually make new bonds by combining the dissolved ions and making new phases, which in themselves control, uh, basically affect ocean chemistry, control parts of the climate cycle. And then I also show you something because a couple of weeks ago you had uh, Juan Mar Garcia Ruiz here. He showed you about the giant gypsum crystal. I showed them to you how we make those in the lab. But let's start with the first one. So if you think of the weathering engine as a thermostat, you know that we, if we have CO2 in the atmosphere, that is a very close link to climate. Climate is very closely linked to weathering. And there is this feedback loop between weathering, CO2, and climate. And up to about 20 to 30 years ago, the assumption was that all the solution of rocks, all the weathering of rocks, that means transforming a granite into a soil, happens primarily abiotically. But then Bob Berner, looking at the last 500 million years and looking at the CO2 record, they, they did a model where they actually realized that actually the drawdown of CO2 in the Carboniferous and at the KPNG boundary was very closely linked to the occurrence of the gymnosperms and the angiosperms. So the development and the development of plants, of two different types of plants, made this so much more relevant. But not just the fact that you had all of a sudden gymnosperms and androsperms in the geologic history, but actually they had the symbiotic fungi. Because if you think about the fact that all the plants which are outside of your of Vigo, about 80% of them have symbiotic fungi. And what I mean by symbiotic fungi, I'll show you in the next couple of slides. But just to put it in context in terms of numbers, if you think about astronomical numbers, you always think of 10 to the 20th, 10 to the 30th, 10 to the 15th. Have a look. Just in the Boreal Forest, which most people think the biggest forest on Earth is the Amazon, it's not true. The Boreal Forest is much bigger. You have 10 to the 17th kilometers of fungal length. If you take one 
square 0.1 cubic meter of soil from outside. You can measure the length of all these things. You have 20,000 kilometers in that soil or 200 kilometers in every kilogram in terms of biomass. So it's a huge proportion. And what it does, it controls 12% of the terrestrial carbon, which goes through every year. And the reason why the boreal forests are also interesting is because as climate changes, basically there are lots of non-colonized rocks here, which all of a sudden the boreal forest will expand towards the north as the uh, melts, as the stuff melts and the permafrost melts, and we need to understand how that happens. So most of the boreal forest, if you think about trees, they're very big. We can't do that in the lab, so we grow very small trees. All of a sudden, the scale has changed. This is now 10 centimeters. This is a tree which we grow in the lab. These are the roots, and this is the symbiotic fungi. So if you think about the fact that these roots, what they do is they go and break down the minerals here, extract things like sodium, potassium, and uh, nitrogen, and give it back to the tree in exchange for the carbon. Okay? So this is the general story, why they do it. In the boreal forest, virtually everything happens that way, because that's the only way they can actually break down uh, minerals. So how do we try to understand what happens when these fungi want to break minerals to get nutrients in exchange for the carbon from the tree? So what you do is you basically grow the little tree, and what we did is we used a, a pine tree, which is typical for boreal forest and its symbiotic fungal network, so you grow the pine tree in a sterile petri dish, and the only thing which is in here, which is only source of potassium, we put in. They need potassium, very important. So you grow them, this is the tree, the roots, and the, the yellow fuzz here is just the fungi. And then we put in their path a flake of biotite, and because it has potassium, and they want that potassium. The reason why we took biotite is because in the Borel forest, the biggest source of new weathering is granite. And most of the granites have clay uh, minerals like biotite or, or, or muscovite, and we decided for biotite because it has the potassium in the interlayer. And so if you think about they grow over it and they will weather it, and we were wondering how that happens. Now, if you do that, what you want to understand is how do they grow over the surface? What do they do to the surface? And secondly, how can we image and analyze both what happens underneath and what happens to the fungi as they grow over the surface. So try to look at it from the biochemical, mineralogical, and geochemical process. But you have to just go one step back, because if you would just take a biotite and dump it into water, the dissolution would happen primarily from the edge. Because it's very simple. To get, these are the potassium atoms in the interlayers. These are the, the, the aluminum and the silica tetrahedral octahedral layers. These are the TOT layers. And it's very easy to get it out. And very little comes out in the basal plane. But now, if you put a little fungi on there, and you have to excuse my miserable drawing tools, but this is looked this way. So the question is, many of the fungi in the Borel forest, and especially the ones which we're using as an analog, they do not go into the structure. They, they, live, they grow over it, and I'll show you pictures of that. So how do they do that, and why do they do that? What happens? So in order to look at that, you actually take now a section, this is not the fungi, and you now go down in scale, right? So this is the tip of the R fungi, and this is 10 microns. And then you took, yeah, use a focused ion beam to literally cut out sections from there, from there, from there, so different sections at different ages of the growth. So the fungi, the tree's here, and it grows, and this is the fungi as it grows. So this is very young contact, and this is older contact. So assumptions without knowing anything, you would say, well, here the weathering is more advanced, and here is just beginning. So you ask yourself, what happens there? And so you cut these sections out, and you'll see pictures like this, where you have the fungi on top, and these are the trenched out, the part which we do it with a focused ion beam. So if you then look at this, the first thing you discover is that if you look at the scale now 500 nanometers, you see uh, this is a diffraction, changes in diffraction angle between that this is the tip where the, 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 just the beginning, when it reaches the surface, a new surface, the fungi, what it does, it changes the angle of the diffraction by about 14 degrees compared to what happens in the bulk. So that is literally at the beginning of the contact. 
So what that means, okay, biotite is a very pliable mineral, but it actually biomechanically has the first step before the chemistry actually can happen. And that is actually very important because in the next step, you then say, okay, what happens now really at a scale, small scale? And now we go down to five nanometers, where you see the 10 angstrom distance between the biotite layers, literally the silica and uh, aluminum atoms, you actually see them there. This is the fungal network. Forget, this is just a control to show you. But at the beginning, although you see a diffraction bending at a larger scale, the biotite is perfect. The biotite doesn't know the fungi is there. But as it becomes older, that means now it's the section three, so it's the much older one, all of a sudden you see that these very perfect, still 10 nanometer distances get bent. So you see the bending, this is the line is straight and this is gets bent. So that, that the whole structure actually bends. And in the even older section, you see that the distances between these perfect layers changes. And if you measure these distances, you observe two things. These distances, 14 and 30 angstroms, are typical of a mineral called vermiculite. Now, vermiculite is literally just the biotite without the potassium. So you strip out the potassium in the interlayer and you make vermiculite. And secondly, we thought, well, okay, if we do that, that's okay, but we get a chemical imbalance. Because if you take something out, something else must happen in the structure. So what we then looked, we looked around and we found that the iron in the biotite, which has both iron 2 and iron 3, has changed and we have new particles forming which are iron 3 particles, very, very small scale. And then we thought, okay, well, let's look at that because there is still a problem. So we used transmission scanning electron microscopy. And this is the same biotite, this is the fungi here, and then this is the biotite uh, fib section. And we mapped this whole area with a transmission electron microscope, and each of the pixels can give you a spectra of the iron distribution. So we know that in the bulk, we have both iron 2 and iron 3 peaks, equally distributed, because that's the standard how it is in biotite. But as you get close to the interface, all of the iron is all of a sudden iron 3. And that is good, because that is first step to balance the fact that you lose the potassium. So this is now the weathered interface. And if you do that, all of a sudden you say, okay, well, I have potassium removed, I have changed the oxidation state of the iron, but I'm still missing a bunch of, you know, I, I have a lot of protons which are there. Where, what happened? So then we thought, well, okay, you need to actually look at how this whole thing looks at chemically, what happens to all the elements as you go across this interface. So in the next step, what we did is we took, we look at this interface by taking a probe and actually analyzing exactly this interface. So between here and here, this is about one micron, or 1,000 nanometers, and we did five nanometer steps to actually analyze the interface. So this is the whole thing here, but most important things is what happened here. So at the interface, you have basically these big steps where the potassium, the silica, and the oxygen obviously change. Because obviously there is no silica and oxygen and potassium, or very little, there's no silica in, and potassium in the fungi, but there is oxygen because they are fungi. But importantly, if you do this and you evaluate the change in all these four different fun, uh, net, uh, sorry, uh, fib sections which we had, you actually can work out how these elements get removed and at what rate. So what you do is you say, okay, well, I can work out how many magnesium, aluminum, iron, and potassium have been removed from the biotite in each of the sections at that interface. So this is now the high full length from the tip. This is section number one, so the young one. And at 750 microns away from it, this is the old one. So you see how these things get progressively more and more removed with depth as well. We know how old all of these things are. That means we know how long the contact was and we actually work it out in days. So we can work out a weathering rate as a function of each step. It's all fine and good, but we still had a problem with the balance of the proton imbalance. So then we thought, well, this is what happens in the mineral, but what actually do the fungi do? Because they must do something to change the mineral. For themselves, their biochemistry must affect it as well. So then as a geochemist, we all like to measure pH, right? That pH is a great thing we'd want to do. 
And as a geochemist, in this world, it's really difficult because these fungi, they don't like to be wet. Because in most forests, we're not talking waterlogged. If I put too much water on these fungi, they die. So that means how to measure pH as a geochemist without water. Hmm. So what we had to do is we had to use what is called a molecular probe. So this is a fluorescent tag which you add onto the fungi. And you basically use that and it will tell you what the pH is by using a fluorescent microscope, a confocal microscope, to tell you what the pH is. That means you can do it without the water. And what we see is that when these are the fungi, and sorry for the fuzzy pictures, but they are not very easy to get good pictures with, with, uh, with our microscope. When the fungi are not on the biotite, but off the biotite, that means they have not weathered it yet, the pH is, as you expect, about 6.4. But in the moment they touch the biotite, they get a pH which is below 4.6. And the reason why we say below 4.6 is because that was, the that was the limit of our molecular probe. So they change the pH by two orders of magnitude, which is good because that helps us explain our proton imbalance. And what they also do, they exude a lot of organic acids, very, very thin layer of organic acids. That means the acidification matches what we see here. And that acidification helps with the weathering compared to the purely inorganic system. But that still does not exactly explain what the fungi do. Because the fungi actually, they don't care about the mineral, they just care for the potassium, they just want to get the potassium. And we were talking last night in a, in a, at dinner, it was like, you know, as geochemists, when we do biology, we always want to imagine what the biology does. So if I would be a fungi, what would I do? I have to change as I grow over a biotite surface, because I have to grow. Now when we grow, we produce proteins. And when we get old, we have, if I would be a fungi, I have chitin. So I thought, okay, how can we do that? So what we did is we basically put the little tree under a microscope, and this is now synchrotron infrared spectroscopy, and we mapped it. And we could reproduce, indeed, that when they grow, they produce the proteins, because that's their push to grow over new areas. When they are old, this is the, 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 the edge, they are just making a lot of chitin. That means they make a lot of sugars. And they have the lipids, the fats, because they are important, because those are part of the cell wall component and part of the hyphae. So this way you can combine knowledge about what happens at the under, in the mineral itself, and as a geochemist, look at the word geo, I'm interested in what happens to the minerals, but you cannot just assume that just by looking at one side of the story, you can understand the whole process. So you need to look at the living part of the system in this case as well. And that's where, you know, working with, with biologists is really important because they tell you things which you didn't think actually are important. So if we look at this first example of how fungi do eat rocks, it's about combining knowledge in mineralogy, chemistry, biology, spectroscopy to try to understand the process where you weaken a mineral, you break it down, you change various different things, both in the mineral and in the fungi, to try to understand how something like that happens. But ultimately, you need to derive a fungal weathering rate to know how much, for example, potassium in our case, does the fungi give to the tree in exchange for the carbon. And specifically, and I just realized I'm missing a slide, I had a slide where I can show you what the difference in weathering rate is if it's done by the fungi compared to just inorganic. And it's up to 20 times faster. So if you calculate that potential increasing weathering rate, that makes a huge difference in how much rocks are weathered and how much of this potassium is going out. Now, most inorganic dissolution experiments, if they would put biotite into water, they would look at silica, because silica is a very important part of the global cycle, and that's a weathering element which people follow. But fungi don't care for silica. For them, silica is a nuisance. So they go for, for potassium. That means you look at all sides of the things. But all of these things happen actually at a very, very small scale level, both in the mineral and in the fungi themselves. So now to the second part of my talk, let's assume we have broken all our bonds and now we want to make bonds. And I'll show you a couple of quick examples of why, do we, why are we interested 
what we want to do and how we do it. And I'll start with this. If you, this is the coast of Devon, and you have very often plankton, which actually form carbonates, calcium carbonates, and they control the ocean chemistry. And there are these, guys, these little guys, which are extremely pretty and beautiful, and they're really, really smart. They are extremely good chemists, much better chemists than we are, because they make single crystals of calcite in a way that we cannot do yet. Some people say that's good, because if we would be able to do all that, we would be out of a job. But actually, they are so much smarter because they are really intricate structures, and they make single crystals. And it's very simple, because it's actually just about calcium carbonate chemistry, which is something which we all learn in the first year in, in geology, right? We learn about, well, you know, have, you have an acid, you have a base. Sorry, I don't know what the equivalent in Spain is when you have anti-acid tablets, right? But it's, it's basically just simple chemistry. And they are very smart at passing, overpassing the hurdles to actually make this work. And what do they do? Well, they build the cliffs of Dover. Do you have cliffs of Dover equivalent rocks in Spain? Like big rocks with like big walls of white stuff? You must have, right? They exist somewhere everywhere. But the important thing is that this is, these kind of things make up that. And I, we made a calculation that in the current ocean, you have 0.75 billion tons of calcite per year. And they produce, per year, you produce a number which is 100 times the Avogadro's number. The number of these lids which form every year is 100 times the Avogadro's number. So a huge amount of calcite a year. And that is obviously, if you think about this being calcium carbonate, it will affect the global carbon cycle because they will draw down the carbon, but they're also producing carbon. So you have to be really, you know, it's, it's a very dynamic process. But from my point of view as a mineralogist, I thought, well, they are too smart to do what I want to do, but let's go one step back and try to understand just a simple chemical production of calcite in a very simplistic way. And if you do that, if you think about having a bucket of calcium and a beaker of carbonate and you mix it, the first thing you do is you form amorphous calcium carbonate, and Bella and, sorry, the, 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 Louis and, and Juice will know this. This amorphous calcium carbonate is actually what brought me to Vigo, because I know uh, Juice's and uh, Louis's paper where they worked on earthworms, which do the same thing. And what they do is they produce this amorphous calcium carbonate inside their guts, and then they actually make it into calcite and pull it out. And I, I was looking at it in an inorganic sense, but it's very interesting, and that's the kind of application which is important. But we want to go really simple to try to understand what are the mechanisms and the kinetics of this transformation, going from here, for example, to vaterite, which is another calcium carbonate, or to calcite. Now, very often when you take a beaker A and beaker B, you mix, you form something, then you have to take it out, you have to dry it, you have to powder it, you have to put it in a machine to measure it. What we wanted to do is we wanted to develop sort of in situ methods where we can actually follow the reaction as it happens in solution, and we want to do it in real time. That means we want to follow the reaction at very, very fast time scales because these things happen. And we want to quantify something which goes from an amorphous phase to a crystalline phase or the transformation between the different crystalline phases because that's what has been shown to happen in coccolites, in forums, in many, many systems. Those are the kind of processes which occur, but we don't quite understand what the mechanisms and kinetics are. So what I'll show you now is scattering data for those people who have, this is not transformed in diffraction. This is just a normal two theta range diffraction. And this is now time coming from there to this way. And this is now seconds. So we can actually take diffraction patterns, oops, sorry, diffraction patterns once every second. And now we have a reactor, bad. What we do is we shine light through it. And as the reaction occurs in our bottle, we actually uh, collect the scattering patterns. And so this is now from 50 seconds to 110 seconds. So this is very, very fast. And what you see here is when you put an amorphous phase into your X-ray diffractometer, you don't get any peaks. You get just the broad humps. But when you crystallize, so this is disappearing, and then you form these peaks, which are the crystalline Bragg peaks, and we follow this. And what you then can do is you can say, okay, well, let me see how this grows as a function of time. And that's what you have now. So this is now almost like extent of the reaction, how fast the reaction goes over time. But time here is in logarithmic units because a lot of things happen at the beginning 
and then it slows down. And I also have put the pH here in yellow, but forget about that. So what you see is the amorphous spheres, they slowly disappear. And the vaterite, this is not the, one of the crystals, which are these little spheres, very, very fast grows. And this is 90 seconds. And then within four minutes, everything is more or less over in this particular reaction. And then nothing happens for a very, very long time. But then this is nice because this is in situ, this is in real time, and we've done it with various conditions so we can figure out the kinetics and the energetics and the mechanism of these things because what happens is you form these little nanoparticles. This is now 300 nanometer scale. These are amorphous calcium carbonate. And then you crystallize them, and all of a sudden you form these spherolites of vaterite. And these are still made out of little nanoparticles, which are very small, but they form these spherolites, so they form by a the mechanism is called spherolytic growth. And with time, they eventually become nice and spherical, and this is now when they are post four minutes, they are happy vaterite. But actually, vaterite itself is also a metastable phase. It likes to go to calcite. So how does that happen? Well, this is an example at about 10 degrees where it happens, but much slower, because now this is 20 hours. So we still have the diffraction pattern. We didn't take them once a second because my students would have hated me because it would have been lots of data processing. So now the, the patterns are taken one a minute. But you see the vaterite peaks have grown. Now they disappear. And the equivalent calcite peaks grow. So you actually see the transformation of one phase to the other very nicely over long time scales. If you look at the same pictures, we start with the same vaterite we had before. And then you see something interesting happen. You see new calcite crystals growing in the same system. But you ask yourself, well, how does this happen? What is the mechanism? And actually, the pictures help you tell that, because what happens is the vaterites slowly dissolve. You see, they become coarser and coarser, and they precipitate on the newly grown calcite. And if you continue that, you actually end up with just calcite and only the memory of the vaterite, but the vaterite is gone. So this is just showing you how the whole process works, and you can use imaging and in situ work, but you have to have them complementary. So if you take it all together, and this is where, again, the similarities happen with what Juice is doing and uh, they have been doing with the earthworms. You make an amorphous phase, which you want to transform eventually, because thermodynamics and geology tells you that this is what you want to make. But you have to figure out what the pathways are, because there are so many small things which can change that pathway. There are times when you can go from the amorphous phase through a spherolytic mechanism to form the vaterite, and then this one dissolves, and you go to calcite, which we have here, amorphous dissolution, vaterite growth, and then vaterite breaks down and calcite grows. But we have done experiments when you add, for example, magnesium, when it actually just goes from here, shoom, directly to here. You can add all kinds of organics, and it does the same. We don't understand quite how and why, but it happens. So that's the kind of thing which we do now, where we use little organic molecules as reactors to try to figure out how that happens and why some things promote it and some don't. In my last example, as a mineralogist, I gave this talk uh, in Granada a couple of years ago, and Juanma came up to me and like, do you think we can do the same thing with calcium sulfate? Because that's sort of the same thing. I was like, mm, poor papa. But then we ask ourselves, is it really that if you go from a solution, if you mix two ions and you make an amorphous particle, and then it crystallizes, and that happens via losing water, so you go from as amorphous calcium carbonate, for example, has 8% water, and then you dehydrate it and it forms vaterite, which has only 1% water, and then you dehydrate it further to make calcite. So is this solution to crystalline process going the same way in many other salt systems? And is this a universal process that you have to have a dehydration? And it came about because in the traditional crystallization world, in the 60s, people have figured out how stuff nucleates and grow, but they looked at basically what happens in the gas phase. That means you take vapor and you make a water droplet. And one of the things which happened that there, you basically make a cluster, a nucleus, and then you crystallize. That is called a classical nucleation pathway. But then in the last 10 years, maybe 15, people have discovered that there are lots of ways 
which work in a different way because it forms these liquid precursor or plenucleation clusters and the amorphous intermediate. But we still don't know whether this is a more universal process because if it is, and it has been demonstrated with calcium carbonate very clearly, it should apply to many other salt systems and that's where the gypsum comes in. And I think you guys have seen this picture before, where is the gypsum crystals from mica. Now obviously I cannot grow these in the lab because they're a bit bigger than you know, my lab is available and this process is slightly different, but we thought let's look at it because not just in NICA, but actually in the geologic history, gypsum, calcium sulfate, is extremely important. Sorry, this is my only sedimentary picture, because I know a couple of sedimentologists here, and I have no isotope picture, I'm sorry. But gypsum is forming in many different places, but, and it formed in many different ways. It was the first window material which we used in our world before we had glass. And these are the kind of things which we do not understand why they happen. But secondly, it's an extremely important industrial material. In Europe alone, we produce, we mine 100 million tons of gypsum per year. And the reason why we do that is because we want to plaster our walls. And what do we do there? We actually make beautiful things out of gypsum. And this is the only picture which I bring because of Louis. We actually use it for many other things, but we also have found calcium sulfates on Mars not just on Earth, so the process is universal. But importantly is the question was if the same process of dehydration and formation would be correct, today when you go to the supermarket and want to buy plaster, what you actually buy is gypsum which has been mined and then you put a lot of energy in to get rid of the two molecules of water to make a mineral called basanite you buy it as plaster of Paris, and that only has 0.5 molecules of water. And what you then do, you put this into water, put it on your wall, let it dry, and it goes back there. Okay? So, this, if you could make this mineral without this energy for 100 million tons, that would be kind of cool. It's not that easy. Why? Because thermodynamics tells us that if you mix calcium and sulfate, the first thing you should form, and I ignored anhydrite here for simplicity, anhydrite is the same thing with absolutely no water, you should just form gypsum. Because this basanite here, which is now the green one is basanite, is much more soluble than here, so that means you should form gypsum. But this is the problem because you ask yourself, well, if that's the case, you form a solution, and based on a non-classical nucleation theory, you should form an amorphous calcium sulfate precursor, which you then dehydrate to form gypsum and then basanite, because this has two mole many molecules of water, if it exists, two molecules of water, 0.5 molecules of water. So classically, this would be the pathway. I mean, I guess you know what the answer is. Obviously, it doesn't. And the reason why it doesn't is because if you calculate based on thermodynamics, only in this area, where in this part you should have only gypsum, and if you look, there's another saturation indices for those of you who are geochemists. If these numbers, and these are negative, 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 only here it's positive, and all the gypsum is positive, so here you should only form gypsum. That's what thermodynamic tells us. And then you have students, and students don't listen. They really don't listen. They go to the lab, they do experiments, they come to you, it's like, no, I'm sorry, there is, no, there is just, not just gypsum, there's lots of other things in there. It's like, no. You made a mistake, go back, do it again. They come back again, no, I'm sorry, I'm really embarrassing, but there is always this basanite around it, I don't know why. And you think, okay, maybe. Mm -hmm. So what they did is they did X-ray diffraction and they showed me these two peaks are the basanite peaks. And yes, there is a lot of gypsum, but at many different concentrations, where you look at here, this number is negative and negative and negative. That means the basanite theoretically should not exist. They find it. I thought, very smart students. I think the problem was this was an issue where the supervisor wasn't listening because they were actually right. And the reason why they were right is because actually thermodynamics on its own is fine because it's built on basic principles, but the solubility of basanite when it was determined was determined from basanite which was produced from dehydrating gypsum. So it's macroscopic basanite. And what we discovered is that you, you can show that it forms at all times, 
even when it shouldn't theoretically form. But you have to think about, is there a method which you can find, which is fast enough, high enough resolution, that you can actually demonstrate this? And obviously, we all want to have a method which has no artifacts. And the answer is, there is no method with no artifacts, but you have to do many different ways of trying to do it to actually figure it out. So what we did is we actually took the two solutions, mixed them, and quenched them very, very fast with liquid nitrogen. It's called cryo-quenching. And then we imaged them at high resolution in frozen states. So theory says, or our assumption was, if it would be non uh, sort of nucleation solution, amorphous calcium carbonate, gypsum, and basanite, thermodynamics. But kinetics says, no, we go from there directly to there. Because we form very small nanoparticles which have bosonite distances, which then transform themselves into nanorods. And this is now 5, 10, 20 nanometers. Eventually, these nanorods, they form individual themselves, and they're not gypsum. And only in the second stage do you have these nanorods. These are the nanoparticles, nanorods. They aggregate and orient themselves in a self-assembled self way. But they're still bosonite. And there is no amorphous calcium carbonate under the conditions of our experiments and no gypsum at the beginning. That only happens because, despite the fact that we are way undersaturated. So this is where thermodynamics says bosonite should not form, but it indeed does. So that means the solubility of a nanoparticle of bosonite must be way, way lower than the solubility of the bulk. And that means thermodynamic is still right. But we don't know what this is. We, are, we have, I have a student now who tries to produce bosonite, which is stable, to work out the solubility of that to actually work it. But in the second stage, what happens is eventually these beautiful bosonite rods, they align and self-assemble and make these big assemblies. They're all little particles assembled in one go. And eventually, they go to gypsum. Yes, indeed, because thermodynamically, it wants to go there. But importantly, it goes from nano, that the, basically the bosonite nano is different than the bosonite bulk, but it's not going via dehydration, it's going via hydration. Because you have to have something which has 0.5 molecules, you all of a sudden you have to go to gypsum, which has two molecules. So it's a total different uh, uh, nanocrystal to macrocrystal mechanism, which is not following the non-classical pathway. And we're asking, this can't be the first time anybody's seen that. Self-assembly of nanoparticles and then recrystallization, rearrangement, uh, must be something which people have seen. It's not that common, but some people have seen it in ti titania, TiO2, and in iron oxides, where they see that these little particles, they sort of self-assemble them along an axis, and eventually they, form, they transform into something else. And most people in crystallography and mineralogy assume that reactions towards equilibrium are driven by entropy, because we want to reach a happy entropy state. But actually, some of these reactions are actually very strongly enthalpically driven. So the, enthalpy, the heat of enthalpy is very much more important. And in these cases, that's the same. We have done the same thing for our system, and I'm almost finished here. But if you look at surface areas, that means when the particles are really small, they have a variable surface free energy, not the assumed, just constant. Because if it would be the classic way, that Enthalpy and the surface free energy is here. That means bosonite should not be stable and only gypsum should be stable. But if it's a variable system, then up to here, you have only bosonite. And only when you reach an enthalpy of close to zero is there a drive for the gypsum to form. And that's why you have the self-assembly and reorientation. So if you put this all together, you start with solution and you do not go to the amorphous phase, but you go to form small nanoparticles, nanorods, these guys assemble and eventually make gypsum. So in our case, it doesn't grow by the amorphous precursor. People are hypothesizing that there are conditions under which this could happen, again, if we could stabilize that. This process can be very fast because you are very highly supersaturated with it. But we now try to figure out how to actually stabilize this bosonite for an industrial process. But it also forms by a different pathway, because it's not the dehydration pathway, which everybody assumed, because it has to hydrate. And that's not easily explained energetically unless you use the enthalpic formation. So does this tell me something about the Nica, Nica uh, gypsum crystals? Well, not really. But I found, you know, if I'm looking at my little gypsum crystals, this 
is 2 meters. This is the same size as 200 nanometers. It's only about 10 orders of magnitude difference. But hey, these are my little in the lab grown mica crystals. And you know, in the lab you have to start small because we don't have 5,000 years worth of PhD time. Our PhD students are only for three years. So they don't want to wait for 5,000 years to grow that. But you can try to figure out and look at them in the same way. So we have broken and we have made bonds. But I think the most important is that we cannot look at any process, whether it's a pure biological process or geochemical process or just chemical process, on its own. We always have to look at the interfaces. We have to look at how minerals react with fluids, fluids react with life. I call it life to make it simple. But it tells us something about how our weathering engine, how that affects climate, because carbon cycling is a big part of it. And remember, calcite forming today in the ocean, if it formed in the past ocean and in the future oceans, is something which actually affects the chemistry of the ocean and therefore it affects the climate. But we still know extremely little about a mineral which is so simple. It's just calcite. We don't know enough about the mechanisms and what drives the formation. We know a little bit more. And my goal at the moment with some of the students which we are having now is to try to figure out can we stabilize a phase which is thermodynamically unstable if we make it at the nanoscale because if we could do that, that potentially has very useful application for the industry. Now, I showed you a lot of data and a lot of stuff. Obviously, I haven't done any of this because I suppose like many of you as my colleagues, you mostly sit in your office, write reports, write proposals. I have a lot of people who actually done all the work and I want to finish with acknowledging their work. So I had a big group of students who have done all kinds of work. So basically they worked on carbonates and you'll see a lot of Spanish names in here. Now, my favorite one initially was Juan Diego Rodriguez Blanco. Because you in Spain always have four names, we made it short. We called him Johnny White. <laughs> Simpler. But I worked with people in, uh, my colleagues in Leeds. I worked with people in Granada on a calcium sulfate work with Juan Ma Garcia Ruiz. And I worked, a lot of the, the work which I showed you actually involves using synchrotron facilities around the world. And many people say, oh, boys like their toys more than girls. Believe me, that's not true. We girls like big toys as well because, because synchrotrons are just places where you go and play with big machines. Thank God you don't have to understand them. It's like my car. I don't need to understand my car. I'm not, not, it just needs to drive properly. I have the boys to understand the car. That's fine. But you do that because somebody gives you money to do it. And I have a lot of fun with science. So hopefully you too as well. With that, I want to say if you have any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you.